sorry, I'm not going to be the bad guy that says people have to move, so I want to be the good person here. Um, I thank you all for coming. Uh, we are here to honor Women's History Month, and we have five wonderful women whose stories have been recorded, and you'll hear more about them in a minute. Um, I am the director of this statewide oral history project called From the Ground Up, Montana Women in Agriculture. This is just one event in a big scope that we're working on. Stop by our display table after and during the reception. You'll see the women we have done and recorded. All of the histories we, we collect and record will end up here at the Historical Society. So people from anywhere and everywhere can gather them and look at them. Um, this project, I'm the director who puts big things together and makes, finds money, but I need the local organizers to make this work. And so also, right now, because I work at the Department of Natural Resources and Conservation, Conservation District administrators work with their local communities to help make this work. And conservation districts are local county entities who work to promote voluntary conservation with private landowners. Um, our mission is to keep going and collecting these stories. Um, this job that I have, we'll have, we have about five more up in Cut Bank that need to be transcribed. We have five more pending to get recorded. But I want everyone in this audience to be inspired after you hear these stories to go home and collect stories from your friends, your families, your loved ones. The things are in place. The website has, my, our website has a questions that you can pose to collect uh, information. The Historical Society rents out digital recorders, so it's there and we want you, if you want to, to go out and do that. Um, by the end of 2014, we hope to have about 30 histories collected and into the Historical Society. Now, um, I want to introduce Pam Busey, who is the Commissioner of Department of Labor, and she is going to moderate our panel and introduce our guests. And would you hold your questions until all the speakers are done, and then there will be a um, question and answer period that you can ask our guest speakers uh, more questions about what they've spoken about. So I want to thank you so much again. This makes us all feel very good. I think we have pretty much capacity out in the hallway. So this just goes to show you that we care and we really want to hear about Montana agriculture from all perspectives, men and women, but for this for this project, we're honoring our women, so I want to thank you all and Pam. Thank you. Well, welcome, everyone. I am so honored to introduce you to these five remarkable women, and what a fitting day as it's International Women's Day. So I'm, it's even better to be sitting here with you all today. Um, as part of this, it's, it's, an, it's really a great time and fitting time for me to be talking about women in agriculture. Um, as part of my job, I have been working with Governor Bullock on his economic development plan, and it, which he's calling the Main Street Project, and we have been traveling all around the state talking to folks on the streets about what are their challenges, what they'd like to see happen in Montana to grow jobs. But in that capacity, we have met a lot of farmers and ranchers who've talked about the history of farming and ranching in Montana and the important role it plays currently and has played in our past um, for uh, the economy. So it's going to be fun to hear what these ladies have to say about that. I've also been working on the governor's Equal Pay for Equal Work Task Force. And something fascinating that we have learned about the farming and ranching community in Montana, um, women make about 67 cents on the dollar for men in Montana. And a lot of that can be accounted for the fact that a lot of women's labor goes unrecorded. It's not really on the books. And reading the, the profiles of these ladies, you'll see very clearly that a lot of labor is probably going unrecorded. So uh, I hope you all enjoy their stories. I hope you'll all ask questions because I know they're, they're anxious to, to have questions asked. So I'm going to start with Glenna Stuckey. Glenna is um, a Powell County rancher. She lives in Avon. And I'm just going to give you a little excerpt from their um, interviews. Glenna talks about um, conservation, and she says, ranchers are the original conservationists, and if we weren't, we would not be here. It's not just a woman's point of view. It's, e it's ears, which is her husband, and mine, and everyone. We have to be so conscious of taking care of the earth. So we'll let Glenna talk to you a little bit about her story. Thank you. And you, you do need to talk really loud in order is to that right? 
Can everyone hear me all right? Um, thanks, Pam. Um, I, I'm just totally blown away with all the people that are here. This is amazing. I think we all are so interested in letting our generations and, pu and putting down our history uh, for our industry and how we are eventually, I mean, we're responsible for feeding the world and taking care of the ground that we live on. My history goes way back to when in my childhood, my parents were farmers. Um, my grandparents were farmers. It's kind of in my genes, I guess. And I married a wonderful rancher, and we have five children, and they all are very conscious of our industry and what it takes to work hard and make things be successful. Uh, I was, uh, we were married in 1954. I uh, was born and raised in the Bozeman, Galton County area. Uh, we, I was in 4-H for years, and Earl and I actually were in the same 4-H club. Kind of grew up together almost. Uh, we went to high school in Bozeman and graduated from there, and later uh, were able to uh, buy his parents' farm out on near Galton Gateway. And our kids were born and raised there, except for the youngest one, Becky. And after about 12 years, Earl was hired as cow boss for the Flying D Ranch, which is now Ted Turner's up Spanish Creek. So we moved over onto the Madison side, and, um, and, and he worked a lot at, up at cow camp. And my job became raising kids from the, that age up through high school, and my kids went to school uh, over at Harrison, so we had quite a, uh, we've always had a long ways f to drive for our kids to get to school, and they were all good drivers because they spent lots of time on the road. Uh, from there, we uh, decided that we would like to become, well, at that point, too, the kids and I took care of our own cow herd, which wasn't very big at that time, but we, we moved cows and at times moved them quite a long ways over, clear over to Bozeman. But we're always looking for grass for cows. It's a story of ranchers <laughs> forever, is it not? <laughs> and um, one time we were moving cows over right uh, to above Bozeman to Sour Doe Creek and going along a road there. Two little uh, elderly ladies in a Volkswagen wanted to get through our cows and so they were going along very slow and we said, well, okay, you can go ahead if you, you know, move through the cows, okay. And they just got started through the back end and we had one cow that didn't like the looks of that little Volkswagen and she backed <laughs> off and she, and she hit them about three times and those poor little ladies were, they were just horrified. <laughs> and we were trying to get the cow away from the Volkswagen and so they just stopped and sat there. So anyway, it was one of the funny little stories that we had moving cows. So later on, we moved uh, over to Avon. We were able to lease a place there, and that was a big step for us. Um, it was hard work, and we, we just moved into haying and doing all kinds of things, learning how that ranch went, and everybody drove a buck rake. The first summer, we were stuck in all kinds of bog holes and finding out about that, but it it has evolved into a wonderful place for us, and right now we are so uh, happy just to be there. And so uh, I don't know if anyone has any more questions. Right now that's where we're at and loving it and, and so happy that we can be involved in this, in this industry and taking care of cows and doing all of the things that go along with it. Well, actually, right now, our, our kids, our, uh, our oldest daughter, Erlene, and her husband, Beck, and their son, Travis, and his, and his wife, Tricia, and their little boy, Michael, uh, are there with us, and Cal and Renee, our son and daughter-in-law, and, our, and um, 
we have two other hired men and we just are you know moving along that way with them everybody works hard and and that's the way it, it goes yeah so now we'll we'll move on to Arlene Pyle Arlene is a Sweetgrass County rancher um, she lives in Big Timber and one of the excerpts from her interview she talks on being a rancher ranching well that's just who I am I know nothing else I've been a ranch woman my whole life so I've also been a mechanic a truck driver I've been a cowboy and a veterinarian it's all tied up to the it's all tied to the ranch activities so go ahead Arlene thank you Pam um, it's very uncomfortable for me to be here right now because I've never done this before so uh, thank you for smiling <laughs> I'll give it my best uh, what I wanted to tell you about today was uh, about the lineage of my grandmother she was born in Norway uh, in the middle of the summer under the midnight sun and that's the way I like to think of her as a eternal person and she was educated and raised and when she reached her late teens she and her brothers decided they would come to America and they came to Montana of all places and she was at full growth she stood five foot two so you know that she was not a, a big lady but she carried a big burden um, <clears throat> She uh, met a gentleman who was a sheep rancher in the Big Timber area, and he had great plans and high hopes for building a community that was viable and functional. And he put together a huge sheep ranch, and along with that, he was interested in commercial opportunities in Big Timber, so he built a hotel that was a state-of-the-art hotel for the time. This was in 1890, 1891, and he worked very hard. That was his trademark. Um, during that, one of the winters when the hotel was about to be finished, they had a horrible winter storm, a lot of rain and a lot of snow like what we've just had, and he got soaking wet, but he kept on working. And eventually he developed pneumonia and was not doing well. So Inga took him back to Norway along with her two small children by that time to get medical care. And while they were home getting medical care, he passed away. Well, this left, this left her stranded. So she and her family and his family helped her make her way back to America so she could tend to things here and she was helping one of her brothers um, with his sheep operation and her brother had a fellow hired that was a newcomer is what people were called when they first came to the, this country and he took a shine to Inga and she took a shine to him and they later married and moved across the river from where they had had their sheep ranch and homesteaded on a place just across the river from where her brother was, figuring they can run the two operations together. And that worked for a while and then the need came as children were born for more acreage and more income generated and they homesteaded on property that was further up the creek from where they were living. And that's where my family of the second family came into play. My father was born on the second ranch and my two aunts were born there as well and they joined a half brother and a half sister from the first marriage. And it gives me profound pleasure and pride to say that that family is still on that drainage, still ranching, still running cattle, running sheep, horses, 
lots of kids roaming around, and we still all get along. <laughs> Inga, Inga was an exceptional lady. She was very gracious. She was very smart. And I like to liken her to a little lady who managed her life with a velvet hammer. Because <laughs> you knew very well you were being jerked up when she told you. <laughs> and she passed away during the 30s, 1938, during the winter, in the early part of the year. Granddad, her husband, had passed away two years previous, and I was maybe a year and a half old when he passed away. And he had, the two of them had put together quite a sizable holding along with the work that they had done. And depression was in progress, drought was in progress. My dad married my mother, she was a charmer, full of happiness and full of joy. And she brightened his day tremendously. And she didn't know a thing about housekeeping or cooking. But she was game, and she did a really good job. But Dad had to teach her how to cook. <laughs> and when I was born, I was lactose intolerant. Well, if you can imagine not knowing anything about housekeeping and not knowing about anything about babies, she'd been an outdoors girl, a tomboy. Think of what a chore that must have been to care for a cranky baby in an old house that was drafty and didn't know just what she was doing. She said the bottle that she nursed me out of, she mixed formula for me, was a bottle with a long tube on it with a nipple on the end of the tube. Can you imagine keeping that clean? <laughs> Good grief. Anyway, it wasn't too long my sister came along Mother was getting to be a really good cook. And school time was rolling around. And the fondest memory I have about going to school was riding with Dad in an old car called a Whippet. Do any of you remember that car? It was made by Willie's. Tough machine. We plowed through Gumbo Hub Deep to get up a hill and down a hill, get to school. And then in 41, we bought a Ford Coupe, and that had a V8 engine in it, and that was cool. And Mother liked to drive fast, so we drove fast a lot. And it was fun. I liked it. But anyway, Dad was a great guy. His brother was a great guy. My aunts were wonderful people, and I'll always think of Inga, gracious, petite, tough little Norwegian, whipping this family into shape. And we're still carrying on. And the women are strong-willed and strong-minded and durable. And it gives me pleasure today to introduce two of her great-granddaughters in this room, Joan Halverson Brown, Eleanor Cooper Ryder. They're both here in town. And they have equally awesome siblings. <laughs> and I've complained a little bit with staying with my daughter that I had sore muscles. I could hardly walk when I got here yesterday. And she nursed me through several aspirins and things last night, and this morning I felt quite a bit better. And the reason that I had sore muscles in the tops of my thighs was day before yesterday it rained and snowed at the ranch and made a bog hole out of everything. Calves are popping out everywhere. <laughs> my grandson who's running the ranch and his wife are both gone for the day, and my great-grandson 
is on a skiing trip. So that leaves my 13-year-old great-granddaughter at the ranch checking the cows, and I'm getting ready to leave, and she's anxious for me to get going because she wants to be responsible. <laughs> and she is responsible. And she pulled a cold calf off of the calving grounds. He was stiff. Inside of his mouth was cold. He couldn't work his tongue to swallow. I just figured he was a goner. But she hopped on the four-wheeler, went out there with the sled, and loaded him up, hauled him to the shed. We mixed up a batch of colostrum and took it up there. Fiddled with that calf for two hours. She says, Great Grammy, you need to go. This is your day. You need to be there. You need to go. I said, okay, I'll go as soon as this calf is sucking. And she filled around some more, and we give him the, what my grandson calls tough love, and we slapped him around a little bit. And <laughs> we rubbed him, and we stretched his neck, and we lifted him up and rubbed his legs. And finally, we felt just a little activity right here. So maybe two teaspoons of milk went down. And we every 15 minutes or so, we'd do that again. And as that claustrum soaked into that calf, you could just see the light happening. And she kept standing there. Uh, my great-granddaughter stood there and said, Wow, that's awesome. Look at that. Wow. <laughs> and it was a thrill to see. And I thought about Grandma Inga and how proud she would be to see that little girl standing there just busting her butt, making that calf go. And it was a pleasure. Thank you. So next we'll meet Esther McDonald. Esther is a Granite County rancher. She lives in Phillipsburg. And one of her uh, fond memories that she talked about in her interview, she says, well, we got up at 6, got the breakfast for the hired men, and then we'd peel potatoes for dinner, and we had the main meal at noon, and then they'd come in, and so we had roast and all that. And then sometimes, about 2 o'clock maybe in the summer, in the haying, all of us girls that lived on the ranches, we'd take our kids to Echo Lake and swim, and we got about two hours or something, and that was really fun. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm pleased to be here. I don't know how I got here. <laughs> I wasn't raised on a ranch, but I married a rancher that probably lives on the oldest ranch in Montana. His great aunt uh, uh, homesteaded in 1864. She, she was at Virginia City and then came to Helena and then Hall and then and uh, brought milk cows for the miners to Phillipsburg, and uh, we, the homestead rights are uh, 1864 in Phillipsburg. We've uh, we have a, a 8,000 acre ranch. Uh, uh, we've added to it all the time. When I when we were first married, uh, my father-in-law and mother mother-in-law were here and he was tragically killed in an accident and uh, so we took over the ranch and uh, bought the ranch with with, her, with uh, from his father or from his mother and uh, sister in 1956 we're, we've been married 60 years. We have eight children. I was born in Seattle, uh, and uh, then I moved to Montana after college when my, uh, my uh, dad was, uh, 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 had been uh, uh, buried. And uh, I, I could say, I think I uh, attended uh, uh, seven schools all for my life. 
uh, my family uh, were pioneers in the, or my dad was a pioneer aviation person, and uh, he, uh, we moved to Chicago, uh, New York, Montreal, uh, Seattle, and in between we'd uh, inspect uh, 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 landing fields in Wyoming, Jackson, and all, and, and so I had a varied life, <coughs> and mother and my brother would always go with him. And uh, then I landed at college in uh, Washington State, and I got a degree in uh, uh, animal husbandry and uh, a minor in journalism, and uh, I, I really enjoyed that four years, and I made lots of friends and their friends for our, our, our lifetime. And uh, I was introduced with 4-H uh, in, uh, in college and I thought that was a wonderful program. And uh, so <laughs> when I was, uh, my mother had a ranch at uh, Darby, Montana and uh, I was a 4-H leader there, and then I have been a 4-H leader in Granite County. So I uh, spent my time uh, that 4-H program, and I think that's a wonderful program. Our, uh, all our kids are, are uh, all 4-H mm -hmm. people, and uh, when they went to college, uh, they met all these people that they met in 4-H and made friends there. My, uh, uh, I don't know what, uh, I have always been interested in legislative uh, for, the, for uh, uh, the farmers and ranchers, and I think, uh, so I had uh, many office, uh, 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 offices in Granite County for the Republicans, and then I, uh, branched out and uh, joined the cattle women I think 50 years ago and uh, I certainly had a, a wonderful uh, experience with Montana cattle women and Montana stock growers and uh, and uh, uh, I traveled from probably Ronan to Ismay <laughs> Montana and met so many wonderful ladies and gentlemen along the way and really uh, got their uh, way of life because we're kind of isolated in Granite County. We've got more cows than people, you know. <laughs> and uh, my eight kids uh, all graduated from college. They, have, they uh, have very good jobs, but they all help on the ranch. And uh, we had a lot. Uh, we uh, we all we had uh, we have uh, diversified. Uh, uh, we have hunters in the fall, and then my one son uh, has an excavating business on the ranch and uh, also a gravel pit. And I think uh, future probably of the big ranches in uh, in our area are going to have to diversify because we have no tax base in Granite County. The mines are all gone and so uh, the cowboys are <laughs> footing all the tax bills. And uh, I guess <laughs> I, I don't know what uh, I don't know what else to tell you. Uh, we, uh, we have run about 500 cows. Uh, we have a leasee because my husband and I can't do the work anymore. But uh, we're calving now and we've got a lot of snow in Phillipsburg. And uh, 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 we've got a neighbor boy or a neighbor uh, gentleman that uh, was a ranch or uh, raised on the ranch. And uh, he is uh, uh, worked for Peter Kewitt for a long time. and. Uh, he came back to the ranch and uh, he is uh, uh, leasing our place for the cows and the hay now. And uh, I've been, I, when I came to the ranch, we had milk cows, separators, 
Uh, we sold uh, uh, eggs and butcher chickens and uh, cream. Of course, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> and uh, when <clears throat> we always had about ten hired men for the uh, for the uh, haying season, and that was uh, my uh, father-in-law used to go to Butte and recruit them out of the bars in Butte, and some some uh, uh, the some of the men would come back. Uh, every year and and uh, they'd sober up and they'd uh, you know they we fed them good and our ranch has always been a, a very hospitable place or a hospitable place for uh, anybody the kids our friends and all the people that are uh, down on their luck i guess we feed we always have a pot of coffee on and I guess I, uh, so I, I did uh, do a, about a 10-year uh, part-time job when my kids were, uh, the youngest was, was uh, out of college at the Anaconda Job Corps, and a nurse uh, 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 friend of mine said, oh, they need a, a helper in the kitchen or a cook in the kitchen, but they have to have a dietetic a person. So I applied and I said, well, I've got a degree in animal nutrition and I think that's <laughs> probably the, and I got the job and uh, anyway, I stayed for 10 years and I really enjoyed that program. It was a part-time program, but I, I really enjoyed working with youth and I, I guess that my I think that we should uh, uh, pay attention to youth and work with them, and uh, and when you get old, just uh, just uh, really uh, champion youth and and teach them where we can, because they're the, gonna be the next uh, citizens of our, our our Montana, and. Uh, I, I often wonder, I, I really, uh, when I woke up this morning, Mount Warren was uh, in sunshine and red, and it's, uh, our valley is very beautiful, and uh, I think that I would never want to li live any place else, so. Just want to let you know, Esther, you'll be happy to know I spent my morning helping my boys that are behind on their 4-H record books get them all filled out. So we're still keeping up the 4-H world. So the next person I'd like to introduce you to, which is a real pleasure for me because I grew up with her. I've heard of her and seen her my entire life, is Pauline Webb, who's a Broadwater County rancher. She lives in Townsend. And she talks about, in one of her... Uh, and during her interview, she talks about the role of women in agriculture. She said, I like the leadership of a good man, but it takes a good woman to stand behind him to encourage him to go on, just like we all need encouragement. Anything I could do, I would do for my husband. When he needed help to pull a calf, I helped. It just takes a good woman behind a good man to make it work. <laughs> and isn't that the truth? <laughs> What did you want to be when you grew up? That's all a question that we all have. We never know what our journey in life is to be. And today I'm going to tell you a little of my journey. But we have to start back in 1840. How did Webbs ever get here? Grandpa Webb was a young boy in Iowa, in Adair County. And jobs were scarce in those days, and he was corresponding with another young man who lived over in Crow Creek Valley. And so he decided that maybe he better uh, come to Crow Creek Valley because he had written him that there were lots of jobs in Montana. So he came to Tostin. Did you know that the trains that were 
used for public transportations used to stop in Tustin. They used to stop in, in Winston. Used to stop, of course, in Helena. Well, Grandpa came to Tustin and got off the train and he realized that Crow Creek Valley was over there across the river. Well, how did he get there? Well, there was a ferry that was there and it cost him 50 cents to ride that ferry. Grandpa went into his pocket and he pulled out a quarter and a dime. He couldn't go. But the mail carrier was standing there and he saw what was going on and he said, would you like a ride? I gotta go over there to deliver mail. And of course, Grandpa got on his wagon and they went across the ferry. There wasn't a bridge across there like there is now. In fact, is we have two bridges across the Missouri River down at Tostin. Anyhow, in the distance as he traveled, he saw some people were building a barn over across the way. And the roof was so shiny. And he said to the mail carrier, I'll stop there, he said, and see if they know my friend. So he got off from, the, off from the wagon and went in, and they were just having lunch. And they gave him lunch, and they asked him what did he want. And he said, I want to know where my friend is, and I cannot remember who, do, who he told me his friend's name was. But anyhow, they said, oh, yeah, we know him. He's, he's working for a rancher on down the road a piece. But if you're looking for a job, well, you have one now. So Grandpa started his life there. That man how, uh, stayed and married a local girl. Her name was Townsley. We even have a lane named Townsley Lane where they lived. And as time goes on, he has a grandson who is named Earl. And Earl decided to take his mother back to visit her, her mother who lived in Iowa. And his, his grandmother lived across the alley from me. And she had come over to the house and said, my grandson is coming and I need someone to help entertain the young people. Would you be able to do that? And I said, yes, I had, had enough time. I probably could do that. But I also had a job uptown. So Earl comes back with his siblings and his mother to see his grandmother. They had, uh, Dolly had not seen her mother for about 20 some years, because the last time she was home was when Earl was a baby. Well, as time progressed, his sister was standing out there and I asked her to go to the movies with me. And so she said, yes, she'd like to go. Well, when we got ready to go, there stood Earl and he said, we don't have movies in Montana. Well, he lied, they did. <laughs> Anyhow, as time progressed, we went, to, we went to more movies, we went swimming, we went to festivals, went roller skating, and I had cousins by the dozens visiting me, and we'd all pull in his car, and we had a wonderful time. But before he left, he asked to go for a ride and, and to thank me for uh, entertaining his siblings. And I can still think I can remember my dad saying, Pauline, there's a cowboy down here, and he wants to take you for a ride. <laughs> well, I went for the ride with him, and he did thank me about having such a good time. And he said, if you ever get an opportunity to come to Montana, do. Well, of course, I didn't think I'd ever go to Montana. Any of that, he went back to his home. Well, six weeks later, here comes Grandma. Pauline, I want to go to Montana, and I cannot go by myself. She was well up into her 70s. And I said, well, I can't go. I'm going to go to teach school. I signed a contract to teach school. I just finished uh, going to normal school. How many of you remember normal schools? <laughs> well, that was what I had been uh, educated to do. And my dad was standing there, and he said, Pauline, you've been working all year long. Why don't you go with, with her and uh, go to Montana? and I'll help you get ready to teach school. See, my father used to be a teacher too, a long, long time ago. And I could tell you a story about he and my mother, but I, hey, I don't have time. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, I went with his, his grandmother to Montana, and before I came home, I was engaged to marry a cowboy. 
he gave me a, a ring and told him to take it back because in those days, if a teacher married, a woman teacher, she lost her school. See, the men were supposed to be the breadwinners. And so that's the way it was. Well, I came back to, to Iowa and I had, a, I had a school and I had 19 students and seven grades to teach. And things were going along fine. And finally, I got a letter from Earl. And he said he wanted to come to see me Christmas time. And so he came. And his announcements right after soon, soon after he got here, said, uh, I don't want to wait any longer. I want to get married. Well, you know what happened. I got married, and I lost my school. And I came to, I, uh, by, to Montana, and for a while, to make a living, Earl worked in the mines. There was a Friday mine uh, right above, uh, right near t Raidersburg, and some of you know where that is. And then there was a, uh, an Ohio heating mine, and he worked in both of those. But time marched on, and finally time came when the cattle needed a new herder. And Earl said, I'm just like a gopher. I need to get out of that hole. I'm going to apply for that job. And he did apply for it, and we did get it. So then we moved to the mountains, 18 miles from civilization. And we spent uh, about nine to 10 months up there. And while we lived, lived up there, the only place that we could get contact with the valley was there was a telephone at Eagle Ranger Station. Now Eagle Ranger Station now has become a resort where people <laughs> can go and live in that cabin and spend a summer in the mountains. Anyhow, I did call home once in a while to, to contact them and tell them that we were doing all, all right. I could tell you so many stories about that life up there. It was wonderful. And we got through with that job, and then there was a man in the valley that needed some fence uh, fixed. He had bought a place called the Boomer Place, and he needed to have that uh, place fenced. So. Uh, Mr. Kimpton asked me, asked Earl if he would uh, help him fence that place. And he asked me if I would cook for them. So um, I stayed a little while longer up there. Uh, then after we came back down to the valley, Earl bought a few milk cows and bought a milking machine. And for two years, we milked cows. And yes, we used to sell cream too. And yes, I did churn butty for butter for 38 years. Finally, had to give it up. Anyhow, a, a man lived down the road a piece from us. His name was Warren Parker. Now, some of um, these people probably remember Warren Parker. He became a representative, and he needed a foreman for his ranch. And he came to us and asked if we would take over his ranch. Uh, by that time, we had a small son who was eight months old. So we gathered up our son and the milk cows, some of them, not all of them, <laughs> Some of them, and we moved down to uh, where Mr. Parker had a, a extra property, which his aunt had lived in, and uh, we stayed there. That, by the way, used to be the old stage stop the, from Virginia City over to, Fer, uh, to Fort Benton. People would start, the stage would stop there and get water, and uh, people would relax, and that was called Lower Town. No, it wasn't the same building that they used for the hotel. It was a new construction. And we lived there for over 60 years. Uh, during that time, our family increased, and we had a daughter and another son. And things were very, very good. And of course, being me, I joined a lot of clubs. And I was very, very busy. I also took a little extra education from uh, MSU so that I'd be more qualified to teach school. And I taught school both in Raidersburg, in Crow Creek, and in Tostin. And we even did an extra course in East Helena. And for a gay Amazola, she had a uh, subject of Indians. And uh, Harla Gillespie and I uh, decided to make, make up a program. And we went in there and helped teach those children. And time goes on, and I joined the cattle women. And I'm telling you, if you don't want to be busy, don't join that club. <laughs> like Esther. Anyhow, uh, they chose me to represent them 
on a new program that was introduced was called AMS. And uh, that was a program where you teach children about agriculture because they were afraid that they might not remember just exactly where all the food comes from. We had a lady just recently driving through Montana, and she says, what does Montana have with all those cows in their pastures? Don't they know that there's plenty of meat in the grocery store? <laughs> so you see, somebody else needs a little education, too. <clears throat> I have been with that organization for several years, and every state in the union has an ag in the classroom uh, system. And when you go to those, those places, you learn how those, those states are teaching young people about agriculture. I was very fortunate to be able to travel to some of those places. I've been to Washington, D.C., to California, and all the places that there are, those places to have a, a good meeting in between. Uh, I'm very fortunate that I was chosen to do this. And I'm still active in the Ag in the Classroom program yet today. Uh, I wish I could share more of these things with you and tell you some of the stories, because some of them are really, well, wait a minute. I do want to tell you one story. <laughs> we one day went up to, Mr., uh, to Warren and Jerry's house, and they ha were having company. And uh, um, they asked us for dinner and to see some films that were they had on uh, these people were from New York State. And we were visiting, and finally Earl says to Jim, run and get the cows, it's time to milk. So Earl, um, Jim took off and came back, and he said, Dad, those cows are really, really acting awful funny. And he went down and, <coughs> excuse me, he uh, had put the cows in the orchard, and we had a good crop of apples. And you know what? Those cows were drunk. <laughs> It took about three or four w days for those cows to sober up. <laughs> but the cows, when Jim had to take them to pasture again, he would, took them past the gate to go to the orchard. They would always hesitate there again. <laughs> My life on the ranch has been very interesting, and I have loved it. And I miss the ranch now because I moved into town. My husband is gone, and at least the place for a while, but you know, things don't always, and ne things are never the same. So I've had a good, good life. Yes, I didn't know what I was going to do when I grew up, and I think I'm still growing. <laughs> Finally, we have Dolly McMasters, and again, such a pleasure for me, also from my hometown of Townsend. Uh, Dolly is a Broadwater County rancher, and one of the things she had to say of her, one of her fondest memories is, Dad bought Mom a new washing machine for $22, thinking it would make her life easier. Mom scolded Dad because that $22 would have purchased 22 more acres of land. But I would like to talk to about uh, in agriculture and actually some of the things that I have done in a lifetime. So to start with, it's hard to reduce a lifetime like I've lived into 15 minutes. So. I'll skip a lot, and I'll talk fast. Okay. But to begin, women have always been in agriculture since the time began. We all know the story of the Indians, how they helped the pilgrims to learn to live off the land. They helped them to get the feathers off that turkey so that they could have Thanksgiving dinner. 
And in grade school, your books told you how the women Indians planted the corn seed. They put in that chunk of rotten fish in with the seed for fertilizer. Came fall, they harvest the corn. They dried it so they would have corn seed for next year. The women also cut up those old buffaloes into strips of the meat that they hung up to dry in the sun so they would have something to eat in the winter time. But my grandparents on my father's side homesteaded here. I am a third generation. Grandpa was a blacksmith, made horseshoes and wagon wheels and all the repairs for horses, buggies, freight wagons. They picked the spot where the animals as well as the people went through the pass because many of them needed help. My grandma was a good horsewoman. She had good horses. She said it took a super good horse to catch a good horse. <laughs> and she had a good team of horses. She used them to plow the garden. She plowed and raised the rye and the oat hay. But where they homesteaded, there was not water, there wasn't a creek close, but they hand dug a hundred foot deep well and it has never gone dry. We use it today. I was raised with three brothers. I was always one of them. Wherever my brother Bud went, I was sure to follow. I watched but opened the door and go out. I was kind of small, but I wanted to go too. So I figured out if I jumped up, turned the handle, the door opened, and out I went. <laughs> but I was barefooted and out to the cattle yard. Of course, I stepped in the cow poopy. I stepped in the chicken poopy back to the house. <laughs> but my mother said, wash your feet in the bucket of water. I did. She told me to stay in the house. When she wasn't looking, I grabbed my shoes and out I went again. <laughs> I'll bet you I was the youngest kid to tie on some kind of shoes. <laughs> but my mother never worried about a babysitter for us kids. She just prayed we were still alive come supper time. <laughs> but, but my father said if I wanted to help, I needed good tools. So he made me a short shovel with a short handle. He made me a pitchfork with a short handle because I was always so much smaller than the boys. But I never lost my tools. <laughs> we raised our food. We were very self-sufficient. We had milk cows, gave us milk, cream, and butter. My mother raised the chickens, so we had the eggs, and we had a stew of chicken on Sunday. But we had uh, uh, pigs, we did our own hams and bacon. We put them in the brine and then we smoked them there in the smokehouse. We had a few sheep. We would ride the buck sheep. <laughs> yeah. Then they got smart and they ran away from us. <laughs> then we'd ride the pigs. Oh, that was a lot of fun. It was hard to hang on to the hair on that pig. <laughs> yeah. But, but one, one morning, when we were getting ready for school, the pigs were out. 
And my father then went to put the pigs back in, and the boar pig then turned on him, and it grabbed him in the thigh, and it tore it bad. But I don't know what kind of a scream that I let out, but my mother came running then with strips of linen, uh, the dish cloths that were made out of the flour sacks there to bandage the, the leg to hold it together. But I don't remember really how Mama and Bud got Daddy to the doctor because I had to go on to school. Then we went to ride in the wild horses. Had to catch them first. <laughs> you learn, that's when I learned to think like an animal, only faster. <laughs> we worked the fields with the team of horses. At noon, you unhitch the team and take them to the barn for the feed and water. You went in the house there to have your own lunch. Mama always had it ready. But this one day we got to the house, we had no lunch, had no mama. We went out to look for her. She was out in the field coming behind the sheep. They had gone to the neighbors. A few days later, those sheep were gone again. Not to the neighbors, to market. <laughs> <laughs> we had many cold, snowy winters. We fed the cattle there with the team and the wagon and the sleigh, even on the mornings that were 20 to 40 below. We chopped the ice, we pumped the water, Spring was branding time. The boys held the calves while I branded. My father said, Dolly, do it right. You're the one that's going to have to find them this fall. <laughs> Good lesson. We dug post holes. I think I dug at least 100 post holes, fencing, cross fencing, that it's no wonder I'm in such good shape. We would butcher her pig there and sell it to the meat market in town. And one day, Daddy came home with what you called a washing machine. He had paid $22 for it. My mother gave my father hell for spending that money. She said, Jim, that $22 would have bought 22 good acres of pasture for the cattle. I don't know if my mother was really that mad at my father or if it was the learning lesson for us kids to value every dollar before you spend it. During the bad years, the government closed the banks. Bud had a five-cent savings account in the bank out here in East Tilna. But the government never gave it back, and Bud never forgot that. <laughs> that was a lesson in your government. <laughs> yeah. Of course, there were many happy days. There were many sad days. There were many broken bones that healed and a lot of good lessons that were learned. But after World War II, then big changes took place. It was the end of the workhorses, tractors, you bought tractor, it could do more work and much faster. The rains came and the pasture grass grew up to the stirps on my saddle. But in agriculture, your biggest element is Mother Nature. 
I'm looking at my good green crop here. Looks like it'll be ready to combine in a couple of days. Second cuttings of hay is looking good. But in the sky, over the horizon, I see the big clouds building up. In five minutes, that grain field is shredded. My hay field, broken, laying flat. But the next morning, my banker's knocking on my door. Dolly, did you have hail insurance? No. Dolly, how are you going to make your payment to the bank? I says, don't worry. I've never missed one yet. He left. I worried. <laughs> but we all did without, and the payment was made. Because we were always taught you paid all your bills. You paid what you owed. But the lesson learned was, come spring, I did not borrow any more money from the bank. I could think of other little things where I could make money. I learned to trap. I trapped coyotes, bobcats, badgers, rats. Gophers. My neighbor gave me 10 cents a tail for the gopher. I was making big bucks. <laughs> uh, during the war, uh, they paid good money there for the hides that had that logger uh, fur on it because they used it for the hoods uh, for the soldiers that worked up north. But you have to think fast to outsmart a coyote. <laughs> but changes are coming faster. Prices are going up both in what you sold and what you had to buy. But for a small farm, you could not afford this high-priced machinery. So you had to think of other ways of what to do. You could see your neighbor was buying bigger machinery. You could talk to him. You could make an agreement, and maybe you could work on the shares. Big equipment companies came up with the idea that they'd hold your contract for you. You could make your payments plus interest to them, and they'd give you a good deal on your tractor. That's okay, but now your banker had to change his ways. Tractors were getting bigger and harder to turn in the small fields. Cost of the seed and the fertilizer was going up. One day, my brother said to me, Dolly, this is not the way to treat the land. He was right. We went to the Townsend Seed Company, and we bought the pasture grass seed. The rains came, and the grass grew beautifully. I felt Mother Nature was telling me we were doing the right thing. We changed from farming to ranching with just our Herford cattle. I still live and work on the ranch with my Herford cattle. But today's women in agriculture are more like God. She's going to plant green today. So she gets up in that $250,000 tractor with the cedar ready to go. She pushes the button, sets the laser beam to the satellite. The tractor goes across the field to that point, turns around, comes back. She has her laptop. She's on the commodity market, though. She wants to know the price of her grain today. That'll be the Portland market. That's what we get here. 
she will see that her price is about $6.42 a bushel. But in her mind, she has to remember, it takes a dollar or more than a dollar per bushel for freight to get her grain there. She has her smartphone with her. <laughs> when its time is just right, she pushes it. It starts the oven in her stove, <laughs> in her kitchen, cooking the roast. She wants, she wants to have supper early tonight because the whole family wants to go to the kids' ball game. Very young in life, I learned about birth. I learned about death and how to accept it, whether it was my favorite animal or my favorite person. But along the way, I learned nothing is forever. Thank you. Very incredible ladies. I'm sure you all have questions. So we have a couple of mics. So feel free to just raise your hand and we'll come out and, and share the mic with you and you can ask them some questions. Uh, I happen to be related to Esther, but uh, I worked on her ranch when I was growing up and all that, and when she and Pat got married. But one of my favorite stories is uh, they were getting overrun by gophers. And Esther, being a fabulous cook, uh, <laughs> decided, well, We'll buy your breakfast and we'll buy the ammunition. You take care of our gophers. Had a lot of fun. Uh, Dolly, I, I remember uh, I worked with Montana Power and I had a lot of dealings with the McMasters, with Bud. And we needed a substation out by uh, Canyon Ferry. So I saw him and we talked and all that, and he says, you know, the old, the old boy isn't making a lot of new land. He says, uh, you want the substation, you plow it out of the hill and level it off and, uh, and do what you got to do. Very good people, all good stewards of land. And I enjoyed all the talks. I have a question from the um, um, lobby. What happened to the hotel in Big Timber? Oh. I'm happy to say that it's thriving. <laughs> Which hotel is it? The Grand. It's a beautiful place. My dad uh, shared recollections with me that when he was a child, that he remembers sitting at a checkered tablecloth covered table under a palm plant eating oyster crackers <laughs> as the birds sang in the cages. Of course, he'd never do that nowadays, but that's a beautiful memory. Well, now it's my pleasure to introduce our entertainment of the day. And it's going to be audience participation, I'm sure, as you all have both of you have your powers. <laughs> um, I want to introduce Judy Williams, and she is from Townsend. She is a
combines her musical background with her knowledge of ranching and the cattle industry, and she records songs from the cow's point of view. <laughs> and her partner is Kara Carla. Carla. Last name? Aher. 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 Thank you. All right, and after the music, after her, uh, she plays a couple songs. A green light on. Okay, if you don't have your ears on, now's the time to put them on. Because you want to be part of this fun, I'm sure. And I want to thank Dolly for wearing those ears. I gave her the opportunity to take them off. I said, I'll forgive you if you want to take them off. And she said, are you going to wear yours? And I said, yeah. And she said, then I'll leave mine on. So what a good sport she is. But if you want to be part of a cow herd, you've got to start thinking like a cow. And that's what I do. I write songs as though the cows are singing them. And I take familiar tunes and write different lyrics to them. And some of the songs might be familiar, but I can tell you that the lyrics are as fresh as a wet cow pie. So you probably haven't heard them. But what we're going to do is the cows have an opinion that maybe the world doesn't agree with. But we have an opinion, and we want to tell you about it. But we're kind of doing a protest. Because Broadwater County is growing. People are moving into our county, and we kind of think of them like an infestation of noxious weeds. Because <laughs> they're buying up land that we used to graze on, and they're closing it up to cows. So we're going to protest as a herd, and that means you have to protest too. So this song has the word mad in it. And when I say mad, I want you to like punch the air and yell mad, okay? And you'll get the idea, I know. Carla's a good leader. By the way, Carla Ahern is a good sport to do this stuff with me. You, we usually have an udder and three-inch eyelashes. And we are called the divine bovines, and I credit her with putting the divine part in it, which you know what that leaves me with. <laughs> But I know you'll have fun with this. If you feel like clapping your hands, you'll have a good time. We're going to do a song. I've got to turn a thing up. Hold on. Well, she's turning her thing up. Um, I just <laughs> want to let you know that she has CDs, and they are going to be available for sale over in the gift shop. Are you ready to protest? Yeah. Why don't you practice? Mad. Mad. No, you've got to be mad. <laughs> Actually, you got to be mad to kind of do this, so, okay. <laughs> you like our tails? <laughs> On the south side of the pasture, where the fence is falling down, we don't dare go down there, because those folks moved out from town. They thought they'd take a gamble, so they bought themselves a farm. But they got no sense and they don't fix fence, but they built a fancy bar. We're mad. Those folks from town moved to where we used to row. They don't like us cows, and we wish they'd go home. Well, they don't like us a grazing. Cause they think we make a mess. They buy manure in bags so pure, but they don't like it when it's fresh. Well, they brought a herd of llamas and a pair of breeding mules. And their emu died when it tried to fly, which the coyotes thought was cool. Ready? And we're mad. Those folks from town moved to where we used to roam. They don't like us cows, and we wish they'd go home. Well, they built a fancy ranch gate to display their new bot brand. But they don't allow cows to live there now, and they closed up all the land. The no hunting signs are plenty, and they paint the fence post orange. But they don't want to go on land they don't own. They don't need food. They're hunting horns ready, and we're mad. Those folks from town moved to where we used to row. They don't like us cows, and we wish they'd go home. Well, their pastures now are weedy, and the creek bed's looking bad. 
But they don't care cause they're never there and their hired man is glad. They don't pay no taxes cause they're saving nature's tale. And they seem to know where to find more dough. They should be locked in jail. Ready? And we're mad. Those folks from town move to where we used to roam. They don't like us cows. And we wish they'd go home. And we're mad. Those folks from town move to where we used to roam. They don't like us cows. And we wish they'd go home. They don't like us cows. And we wish they'd go home. Because we're mad. And that's the divine bovines for you. Thank you. Judy. Judy. If you have time, I think we'd love another one or two. Oh, I could do 40. <laughs> do you guys? <laughs> um, we're going to do a song about a ranch lady, and this is calving season, so we're going to do one about the ranch woman that goes and checks the, cal the heifers that aren't calving like they're supposed to, okay? If I can find it. Hang on. I actually did record these songs at home. They're on CDs, but when I do this, I can't play my keyboard and act stupid at the same time, so this is what you get. What's the name of that song? Oh, I know what it is. Does anybody else there have any idea what it is? Hang on. Um, we'd also like to thank Denise Thompson, excuse me, my mouth is dry, for asking us to be here and for all of you people for wearing the ears because you're good sports. I always tell people you can't be pretentious when you're wearing a set of cow ears. So. <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> That's later. I heard that comment. That's coming. The shoes go as we leave the building, there'll be shoots out here. <laughs> we thought you got away that easy. Right? Yeah. Hang on. Another question from the uh, auditorium audience. How many of your children are still on the ranch? Big Timber Arlene Pyle has five. Part five, four. Um, Esther McDonald's over in Phillipsburg's four. Uh, three of our children and our grandson and, great, and one great grandson. Okay, and Avon, three children, one and grandson. Help me out with the math. <laughs> five. <laughs> and Pauline says from Townsend, we educated our kids and they all left. <laughs> um, are you ready, Judy? I'm ready. If you, yeah. Well, one more thing about Judy. Um, do you play for public events? I do. I do. I do. And so we are cheap. <laughs> So we, travel, we travel throughout Montana, and we've been going to Canada, and I'll tell you what, the Canadians love cow songs. So, and they like to drink beer, so the <laughs> songs are funnier to the Canadians for some reason. I, I, don't know. I don't know. And Judy has a website, so just key in her name, and you'll be able to get her contact information. It's written on the ears. By the way, Clever. I put these ears on my website, and last year I got an order from a dairy in Australia that bought my ears to sell to their customers. They give tours on there. So these are international ears now. <laughs> and I, when I got that email, I told my husband, there's two good things. Number one, somebody from Australia found my website. That's a good thing, because I put it up myself. The second thing is I'm not as nuts as you think I am. <laughs> and by the way, we ran out today. I know a lot of our audience doesn't have them. So oh. we apologize for that. So we have at least 150 here today. Wow. That's a good thing. OK, here's a calving song. This might put you to sleep. I hope not. You could do some swaying, maybe. 
the wave. I can see the ears going. This is about calving season and a wife's role. It's four in the morning and you should be snoring. I don't think this time. I forgot the words. I know it's sold out, but I have my doubts that I'm going to calve here tonight. You look like a mess. Was it dark when you dressed? Did you tuck your jammies in tight? It's four in the morning, and you should be snoring. I don't think I'll calve tonight. Your wife was just here, and she checked far and near to catch us calving, she hoped. But nothing was happening, except her robe was flapping, and she really looked like a dope. Then she looked like Flipper when she fell cause her slipper collided with a frozen turd. And she lay there moaning and groaning and groaning and teaching us new dirty words. Now does that sound familiar to you ladies? This lady won't quit playing the piano, so we just have to sway through this verse. As you know, cows can't dance very good because they have two left feet. <laughs> it's four in the morning, and you should be snoring. I like to catch you up on our sleep. We don't like your flashlight because it's too darn bright and you make us get on our feet. You circle around and you check on the ground to see if the calf has appeared. It's four in the morning and you should be snoring. We're tired of you checking our rears. It's four in the morning and you should be snoring. And we need our sleep around here. That's what the cows think. Thank you.